And you look at things like even usage of social media or just iPads and cell phones and how much. If that becomes common for parents, then what would stop, you know, them from having children that then have, you know, right out like uh, in the crib looking at the iPhone and kind of doing all of that? Do, do you feel that that needs to be addressed a lot to social media technology? You know, I remember Bill Mayer made a fuss of being like social media and technology are the new cigarettes. They're addictive. Mm -hmm. They rot your brain. They know what they're doing. They're profitable in that way. And, and now we have children, you know, on that. How much mm -hmm. of this issue has to be about limiting the exposure to technology and going back to putting kids in nature first? Well, I mean, technology is definitely one of the major stressors, like categories of stressors. In our study that I mentioned before, we have yep. categories of stressors. It would be chemical stressors, pharmaceutical stressors. Um, EMF exposure and technology exposure is its own category. And, and it ranks very high in terms of like you look at all the data. We've been collecting data since 2018 to see how tightly is that, you know, each category correlated with worse health outcomes. And that's right up there, believe it or not. Most people don't even believe that, you know, these this, the digital life is harmful. But it really is. And so on so many levels, I mean, you, we could dissect it. Is it the electromagnetic radiation? Right. Is it the, you know, the what it does to relationships? Is it the fact that it's, you know, bringing kids indoors under artificial light and being stagnant and not moving? Like there's so many variables there that that explain why it's it's harmful to kids' health. It's absolutely a problem that we have to, I do think we have to think about that as um, one of several categories of stressors that need limits for all of us, for kids, sugar would be another one. Sugar is ubiquitous in this society, like absolutely ubiquitous. Like everybody that goes in for a coffee is getting like a sugar bomb dump into their blood system every single time they go to Starbucks. And um, we've normalized that, right? Yeah. So like we, it's so just like you said, smoking, we don't allow our kids to smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't allow them to use illicit drugs. We need to put similar limitations. I'm not saying to make sugar illegal. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying we need to be, we need to understand the poison that it is to our bodies and put limitations on it. Similarly with the tech and the technology, like there are people who set limits. Like I'm not going to let my child get a phone or a device or whatever until ninth grade. Like put a yeah. limit as opposed to here's an iPad for your two-year-old or your three-year-old. Put limits. And I think the reason... Part of the reason why parents haven't put limits on technology in particular is because it's so new. I mean, yeah, it is so yeah. new. We've had the internet like for a couple of decades, right? And the device is even less time than that. So like they, they can't look back to their parents and be like, well, my parents didn't let me have an iPad until I was 16 because there were no iPads. Right. So that's education, right? Like that's just letting parents and educators know that there is a, a need for limitation. So yes, uh, that's one of many categories that we haven't quite caught on. So it's good that we limit smoking and illicit drugs, but like, let's right. keep moving on the on the, uh, the categories. If there's a parent listening right now, and I, I know you're a parent of three, so I'd love to hear your experience with this, because I, I get this a lot too from people I know is that, listen, it's, it's incredibly hard to have your child kind of prying over these things, feeling like an outcast because they mm -hmm. can't be on their phone all the time while every one of their friends is FaceTiming late into the night and doing things. And then they start to get depressed because of that, let's say, or feel like an mm -hmm. outsider. And then all the things that come with that stress and anguish. How, mm -hmm. how do we how are we able to kind of balance that? Because it is true. No one wants a child to be that kind of outcast that's too granola and, you know, not using uh, anything that that the, all the other kids are using and mm -hmm. coming in with their very different lunches when everyone's eating a certain way and doing right. all that. Uh, how, how are you doing and what's your advice to parents that are struggling with that? So when my kids were little, um, there were two things that I think helped insulate us from that feeling of being different from everyone else. They were um, community and courage. Mm -hmm. So community, um, I remember moving to a new town and I met some new friends when my kids were little, you know, like elementary school below. And um, these new friends, we started just, I got involved with a group that wanted to bring healthier food to the school. So I just, I was like, who's my people? I want to go find my people. So I found, found some people that cared about food. And then in conversations, two of these friends of mine decided they wanted to become, they wanted to learn more about nutrition. So they went and became health coaches. And then we started having play dates with my kids and their kids. I was hanging out. My community was people who cared about the same things I did. So when my kids went over to their house for play dates, they, I was like, yep, they're going to feed them something healthy because they care about the same thing. So my kids are going to feel normal. 
The other part is, I said, is courage. And I, I remember going that through that um, feeling when I first sort of changed my lifestyle and like woke up to what was happening to this generation of kids. It was because my own kids were sick and my own kids had issues. So I had to go through my own awakening. And then I felt like an outsider, like I'm doing things differently, cooking my own food. But the minute I started voicing it and being like, yeah, you know, I'm going to... um. I'm going to make my own sourdough starter and I'm going to make my own kombucha and just said it out loud. I mm -hmm. took courage. So I'm like, they're going to think I'm weird. But then somebody would be like, so how do you make kombucha? What is kombucha? What's that? You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, that's what I mean about community and courage. The more you feel courageous about just why do we have to feel like scared or intimidated about doing these things that are healthy for our bodies? You know, why do we feel scared to talk about it? That's the courage piece. But the community piece is find someone else who is doing this with you and wants to do this with you. You know, it could be a, a sister or a brother or, you know, just start somewhere with somebody who sees things the way you do. And if you can't find them, go out and find them. Like I said, I, I looked, I joined a group that was like trying to change the food in schools. Like go find your people on the internet and connect with them. And then you'll feel less alone and you'll feel that courage and that ability to say, I'm going to, I'm going to protect my kids and give them play, like playmates that are on the same wavelength. Yeah, no, it's really good advice. And the one thing I'll say, because I grew up in a very different household, my parents were both doctors, they came from Europe, immigrated here and kind of had a more, you know, whole food mentality, no junk food there. They never grew up with it. So they passed that along to me to where mm -hmm. kids came over. They're like, oh, your kitchen sucks, man. Like, you know, let's let's ditch this place and go like eat the, you know, hostess cupcakes and everything at my place. And, and it's. I grew up in the house of a dentist. Same thing. Okay. No Good sugar job. in the house. So I, I relate. Right. And and the thing is, listen, you survive. I wasn't like picked on that much because of it. You do grow courage and be like, hey, this is my parents' way. I do it my way. I know I'm different. I'll go over your place, have some of your crap and everything and keep eating. But I will say this to any parent that's struggling with that and kid being like, I wish we had more junk food and everything. I am I, like once I got out of childhood, I was in such a better place to mm -hmm. carry on healthy habits because it was already my habit. I, I didn't have to even think about do I want the junk food and everything else as I grew older. Mm -hmm. um, and it left me in a place where I was healthier than a lot of my friends when they start reaching ages where it really starts to impact you. Maybe mm -hmm. when you're a kid, you compensate for all the sugar and fat and you have a higher metabolism. But yeah, you get in your 20s, 30s, 40s and you keep eating that way. That's not going to be good. You will right. develop chronic disease then and you will live with that and you'll say, why did that happen? And oh, Casper must have been lucky with his genes. Right. Like, no, yeah. <laughs> that stuff runs in my family too. We just didn't eat to trigger that epigenetically. Right. So you know what one of my favorite stories around that is um yeah. do you know Jordan Rubin? He's the one mm. who started the Garden of Life and yep. um is such a health guru, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the story is that he was raised by this hippie mom who, you know, fed him wheat germ and like all, like no sugar in his house, no junk food, you know, his mom was super crunchy and just raised him in a holistic and natural way. So he went off to college and apparently, you know, drank his face off, ate pizza, <laughs> like all the things that he was restricted from doing as a kid. Yep. Um, and then got so sick and that's where he developed Crohn's disease and was hospitalized, like nearly died in the hospital because mm. his Crohn's disease was so bad. But he always told the story, uh, at least that I've heard, where like it was the roots right? His mom gave him the roots. So like he overcame yep. Bond's disease, he became healthy and vibrant. And now he's got this enormous health and wellness brand. And mm -hmm. he you know, has all this um, incredible, you know, vibrant uh, health teachings that he you know brings out to the world. But it, it's because his mom gave him the roots, right? Yes. So he, he went off and he made his own choices. And he learned like, oh, this doesn't work. I can't, I can't eat like this. Yeah. I can't live this way, but he came back to the roots and he became healthy again. So like, I always like it for my own kids. I have three teenagers now they're, you know, they're out doing their things. Sure. And I, I just, I just have that faith that the roots that I gave them are going to be enough for them as adults to come back to. And you're living proof of that too. You had good foundations and roots and that has allowed you to live, you know, as a healthy adult. Yeah. Um, big difference. Huge difference. It, it's, it's roots and also tools because I feel like everyone at one point in their life reaches a place where they're going to deal with a health issue, whether it's acute or something else or long term, it could be depression after a major event or something like that. And then it, it does boil down to your foundation of roots and also the tools you have. Mm -hmm. So when I go into those places, because I'm not superhuman and always healthy and feeling happy, at least I could turn to those things. I could do some breathing exercises, meditation, EFT tapping, turn to my homeopathic supplements, everything else around there 
and say, mm -hmm. okay, this will catalyze me to come back to that healthy state. 